There's a verse in the book of Acts where it talks about the early Christians, and it says this in the 17th chapter of Acts. These people who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. They are all defying Caesar's decrees. They're saying that there's another king, one called Jesus. The early Christians were called enemies of the state. They were executed for insurrection. They were jailed and tortured uh, because they had their entire lives reoriented by Jesus. And every time they declared Jesus is Lord, they were saying Caesar is not. That confession is deeply and subversively political. It would have been as strange to say Jesus is my Lord 2,000 years ago as it is to say Jesus is my president in 2020, to say Jesus is my commander in chief. It was an invitation into a new political imagination that centered around the person of Jesus, the teaching, the life, the peculiar politics of Christ. So one of the big temptations in election year is to misplace our hope. We're tempted to put our hope in a party or a candidate and think that they will save us from this present darkness, that they will restore uh, the time uh, before this chaos. And yet there's that old hymn that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And there is a lot of sinking sand. Lots of big promises and empty words. We are bound to be disappointed if we put too much hope in a person or a party or anyone but Jesus. Joining the politics of Jesus is about joining God's redemptive plan to save the world. And it is about fidelity and allegiance and hope and a new kingdom, a new world breaking forth in this one. So as Christians, we can say that our hope is not in the donkey of the Democrats or the elephant of the GOP, but our hope is in the lamb, the lamb of God who never fails us. So I am hopeful in 2020, not because I've found a candidate or a party uh, that's going to uh, fulfill everything I want to see in our country, but because I've learned to hope differently. My hope is not in Trump or Biden or even America. My hope is in Christ alone. So now that we've established that, let me say that uh, there is a lot at stake right now, and faith is on the ballot. So I will be voting on November 3rd. In fact, I'm voting uh, just after I preach this sermon. I got my little ballot right here. But I'm not looking when I vote for a Savior. I've found the Savior. I'm looking to do damage control, harm reduction. I'm looking to harness the principalities and powers that have been hurting God's children far too long. I'll be voting for the people who I think are going to do the least amount of damage to the world. <laughs> the, the folks who I think are going to hurt the least amount of people who might alleviate the suffering of some of our brothers and sisters. That may sound a little cynical to think of voting as damage control, but I think it's more faithful to that political imagination of the early church. And there are those who will say that they can't vote because they don't want to hold their noses and go into a voting booth, that they don't, they don't want to choose between the lesser of two evils. But I want to say that opting out has consequences. Uh, privilege is being able to choose which issues matter and which ones don't. Privilege is being able to opt out of decisions that have life and death consequences for other people. I believe this election is a referendum. We know who Donald Trump is, but this election, what is at stake, is who we are 
That's the question. Who we want to be as a country. And we have the power to steward our voice in one particular way this election season. I want to look back and say I did everything I could to stand against fear and racism and hatred, including vote. I want to use every tool I have at my disposal, every tool in my toolbox. So as a Christian, I'm convinced that the issues like immigration and health care and the growing disparity between the rich and the poor, these things matter to God. Abortion also matters. But for many of us, that's the only issue that we voted on. And to be pro-life for me is not just to care about abortion, but it's also to concern myself with all the issues of life, ending the death penalty, standing against racism and police violence, welcoming immigrants, providing health care to those who need it, ending gun violence, defending, defunding the war budget, responding to the environmental crisis. These are life issues too. And right now, in our country, one of the most urgent things at stake is to stand against white supremacy and racism. We are at a crossroads in this country when it comes to racial justice and dismantling the myth of racial hierarchy, reckoning with 400 years of our country's history, this idea uh, that some lives matter more than others. And I want to say that, uh, you know, there are folks that their rebuttal to Black Lives Matter is that all lives matter. As we talk about how precious every life is, there is a historic backdrop that we can't ignore. 400 years of racism and slavery still has residue. It still has a mark. We can't get our future right until we get our history right. Our country is built on stolen land with stolen labor. We ripped African women and men and children from their families, horrifically denying any notion that they were God's precious children. We sold black bodies on street corners, contradiction, contradicting any conviction that black bodies are God's temples as much as white bodies are. In landmark cases like Dred Scott, again and again, we affirmed that white lives matter more, that black folks do not have any rights that white people need to acknowledge. Even the founding documents of our country consider black folks as three-fifths human and calls natives savages. The same forefathers who penned the words, all men are created equal, also owned black people as property. So we have this paradox at the heart of our country. So there is something to be said uh, about the particularity of God's love given that history. To say that black lives matter doesn't mean white lives don't matter. To say black lives matter is to say that we want to affirm what 400 years of history has denied. It doesn't mean black lives matter more. It means black lives matter. If we cannot emphatically say that black lives matter, we don't really mean all lives matter. I heard a comedian, I think it was Michael Shea, who was uh, doing some stand-up, uh, and he, uh, he said, uh, when your wife comes up to you and she says, uh, honey, do you love me? You don't say back, baby, I love everybody. <laughs> you know, if you do, you'll be in big trouble. But uh, what we, when I think of th- this history, what our, our brothers and sisters are in the street, thousands of them right now saying, uh, we can't breathe. And they're asking us to affirm that their lives matter. So I love that God so loved the world, but I also love that God loves you and God loves me. God loves us in particular ways and when um, in personal ways. And when Jesus was affirming 
those people that, G, that, that God is blessing in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. He's naming those who have been crushed in this world and saying they, they matter to God. God is blessing the peacemakers and the poor and those who grieve. And it occurs to me that this administration, our government, is crushing the very people that God blesses. And if some, I think if Jesus stood up to say and, ble and said, blessed are the poor, someone would say, stand up and go, oh, wait, 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 all lives matter. God loves rich people too. God, we want God to bless everybody. So we need to be able to say, God blesses the poor. God blesses those who mourn. God blesses those who are crushed. Our black and brown brothers and sisters, their lives matter to God. And so right now, I want you to think about this. If you have a hard time voting for a particular candidate, consider what it means to vote for the people that Jesus blessed. What does it mean to vote for the poor? What does it mean to vote for the peacemakers? What does it look like to vote for the marginalized? Those Jesus called the least of these because when we vote for them, we're voting for Jesus. We want to vote for immigrants and families separated at our border. What does it look like to vote for the children in cages and those without health care? I'm going to vote for Breonna Taylor this election. I'm going to vote for those who are are incarcerated and their vote has been taken from them. I'm going to vote for the victims of violence. I'm going to vote for love because love is on the ballot. This election season, we see faith and love at war. And there's that scripture that says, perfect love casteth out fear. Fear and love are opposites, like opposing magnets. You can't hold them together. And so we are at a crossroads where we have to choose between love and fear. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose love and rest confidently in that promise that love casteth out fears. What would it look like if love was the compelling force behind our policies love instead of fear. So I'll vote on November 3rd. I will vote against hatred and fear and misogyny. I will vote against Trump. I will vote against all those who have enabled these hurtful policies and this hateful rhetoric. And I'll do so because my ultimate allegiance is to Jesus, is to Jesus. So this election day is not the only way we make a difference. And it's important to remember that, that for Christians, we don't confine our voice to one day every four years or two years. We vote every day for the kingdom of God. A change doesn't just happen on election day. It happens every day. We vote for the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. And that change doesn't just happen on election day. So let's vote on election day. But then, Whoever gets elected in November, we better be in the streets holding them accountable in January. We are still going to have to be a prophetic voice, lifting up the things that are at the heart of God. So vote with me because faith is on the ballot, but do not limit your vote voice to election day. Let us seek first the kingdom of God every day, every day. In Christ's name, amen.